and welcome to The Honest Channel. I'm Claire Johnston, a journalist with an interest in all things anti-aging. And what's becoming very clear through scientific research is that what we eat plays a dramatic part in how we age. Poor diets, particularly those that lead to insulin resistance, have been linked with just about every age-related illness. But just what does a good diet look like in this day and age? Because as most of us know by now, the science is conflicting. You have high profile advocates of keto diets where you eat only a very small amount of carbohydrate and rely on high quality fats for energy along with protein. But that diet has been linked with higher cholesterol in some studies. So that leaves a bit of a question mark over it. We hear conflicting reports about intermittent fasting like the five to two diet. Some people are even turning carnivore. In fact, a scientist with a supplements business who recently appeared on this channel told me she had switched to a mainly carnivore diet where you're largely just eating animal products. We hear a lot about the Mediterranean diet, which is probably the one I feel most comfortable with. It's recently been found to lower the risk of heart disease in women by nearly a quarter. The Mediterranean diet includes a broad range of natural and nutritious foods, including fruits, nuts, vegetables, seafood, beans, and whole grains. But with so many books being published now around what to eat for longevity, and so many experts on social media sharing their own diet plans, just what are we to make of it? Here to help us make sense of it all is nutritionist Barbara Bray, who after 20 years of working in the food industry, had what she calls a penny drop moment when she realized the extent to which the industry was feeding a health crisis. Since then, she's dedicated herself to learning more about nutrition and healthy aging and improving nutritional quality in the food industry. In 2019, her work was recognized in the late Queen's birthday honors list when she was awarded an MBE for her services to food nutrition. So let's hear now from Barbara on what healthy eating for longevity looks like to her. Barbara, thank you so much for joining me on the channel. Um, I just know that my viewers are gonna be interested in, in the perspective that you bring as a nutritionist and with a particular interest in healthy aging and how what we do and don't eat can affect that. So it's good to have you. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the invite. You're most welcome. Um, I, I wanted to start really just by finding out what brought you um, to nutrition with, with healthy aging specifically in mind. How did you end up in, in that area of interest? It was a bit of a journey. So I've got around 25 experience working in the food industry. And around about 2014, when the FIR, the Food Information Regulations, came out, I was working in a business where we were having to look at the labels and the recipes of everything and make sure that we didn't have anything that was too high in fat, too high in salt, too high in sugar. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly realised that we make these ready meals and churn them out. And yes, they might have potatoes and vegetables and such mm -hmm. like in them, but they weren't actually a great advert for a healthy diet. And at that point, I started to look at what we needed to be doing differently, what we needed to be better at within the food industry. So it was kind of like my penny drop turning moment mm -hmm. where I went into nutrition and I then went to back to university and did a master's in human nutrition. And from then on, I've been focusing my career on how I can improve nutritional quality within the food industry and different companies that I work with. And the PhD really came about because I had an opportunity to look at improving health or improving the diet of older people, but working together with industry. So my PhD really comes into three parts. There's the, what are people eating now? People once they're mm. 65 and over, and what should they be eating to be able to live well for longer? Because we know that, you know, the average age of the population, the people live to around 80, 82. But in terms of the number of healthy years they might get, they might only get to 63, 64 before developing an, a chronic illness. And we know that one of the things we can change is diet. There's so many things we can't change, you know, like, you know, becoming wealthier or mm -hmm. moving house or uh, mm -hmm. our genetics. But food is the one of the things we've got left to play with. And that's really where I felt I could add value as a researcher. And I mean... How big a difference do you think a change in diet could make to somebody's uh, quality of life and lifespan, you know, living well for longer? Presumably, it could have a way more dramatic uh, impact than most people think. The difficulty is when you eat, you're having to make choices every single day. And when you're young, 
you have got an element of choice and flexibility. Obviously, you're taking food from the environment where you're at. You know, I'm a nutritionist. If I want to eat a healthy, balanced meal every day, I know what to do. But if I'm sitting in an office that's next to fast food restaurants, then I'm never going to get to that healthy diet. So it's there's a lot of context that goes with it. But what tends to happen as we age is we develop certain illnesses or conditions that might limit our food choices. Mm. So when I've been doing my research, I've been talking to people who say, I like to eat lots of fruit and vegetables, but I have arthritis in my hands, so it makes it hard for me to chop up fruit and vegetables. So that individual individual hasn't decided not to eat a healthy diet it's more that their circumstances are being forced on them whereas you know if it's if it's somebody who's in midlife you might think well I can't be bothered that's a whole different Mm -hmm. point that you're coming at it from but diet we can within our limits we can make changes so for example we can decide to add more vegetables to our plate we can decide to add more whole grain cereals and switch from ready-made cereals to having porridge or something like that that's easy to do and that's going to be helpful and all of these little changes will make a subtle difference so it's over a long period of time and that's where the difficulty lies because you can't see an immediate change Mm -hmm. and things like that are good to know because if you're in your 40s the sooner you start making those changes the better health quality you will have as you age. You're currently researching the best diets to protect the health of older people um, and that's part of a doctoral training program is that right at Queen's at University in Belfast and are you able to share any insight into what's emerging from that research as, as the best diets as we age? What I've seen when women are aging women tend to have been on a, a diet as in mm-hmm. they have been on a calorie restricted diet for most of their lives and the danger with that is Yes, we're always being told that we need to lose weight because if you are obese, then there are health impacts, but there is a tipping point. So what tends to happen is people go on a diet saying, I need to focus on reducing my body size. But actually, once you hit 40, you start to lose muscle tissue and your muscle mass decreases. So if you go on a diet as well, that can accelerate your loss of muscle mass. And that leads to frailty. And we know that if you become more frail, you're more likely to have a fall. It's that that lack of diet quality that I think is leading to frailty and then, of course, malnutrition. So we know that about one in 10 of people living in the UK who are over 65 are either at risk of malnutrition or they are already malnourished. And that's a huge amount of people. So already if we can help women particularly, I'm not saying it's just women, Mm. but if we can help women understand that it is important as you age to start adding things into your diet rather than focusing on restriction, you can already make sure that the balance of, of nutrients, so vitamins, minerals, carbohydrates, proteins and fats is correct. Because we know that older adults are eating slightly less protein than they could mm-hmm. get away with. We want to, to be the, the optimum levels rather than just eating the minimum amount. There's still a bit of room for improvement there as well. Yeah. I'll come on to that in more detail, actually, because I I wanted to ask you about, you know, calorie controlled diets and and what we're told about fat and sugar and that kind of thing. Um, But, you know, we we are told that middle age spread is a particularly bad thing as we age. That fat around our stomach should be of, of particular concern to us. Why is that? But unfortunately for us as humans, we do put on more and more weight as we age. So Mm. from about the age of 40 to about the age of 66, we're putting on something like, you know, just about a quarter of a kilo to half a kilo every year for that period, and maybe even beyond that period. And for women in particular during that menopausal time, so from perimenopause, just before you enter menopause to just after, you will be gaining a lot more weight. Mm. And what tends to happen as humans, we tend to get that weight around our middle. So mm. we it's called the visceral fat. That's the fat that wraps itself around our organs, which is different to the fat. So if you just press on your tummy, the, the fat that's just below the skin. So that's the mm-hmm. subcutaneous fat that's just okay. below And it's the visceral fat that is the one that is going to affect our insulin sensitivity, for example. So rather the more body fat that we have around that area, the the more it impacts our insulin sensitivity. And we need insulin to make sure that when when our food is being digested, the right amount of glucose is going into our blood and into our brain and so on. So the liver has got it all under control. So 
that's why the, the medical profession are constantly saying we need to try and make sure that we don't gain fat there. Having mm. said that, if you do lose weight, it tends to, depending on your genetics, it tends to go from there anyway. But the difficulty is if you get into this yo-yo dieting, you're not actually losing weight. What happens is you lose a bit, you gain it again, you lose mm. a bit, you gain it again. And that's where the damage is happening as you age, because you've also got this issue of the muscle mass loss. And if you're not doing enough exercise to maintain good muscle mass, and if your diet quality is poor, then you're not being able to have the, the calcium levels that you need. And you've probably not got good vitamin D levels as well. So mm -hmm. all of these things are working against you because you're focusing on one thing and that's your weight. Whereas you need to be focusing on your blood pressure, your blood sugar, your cholesterol levels, a whole suite of things rather than just one thing that isn't really under your control, but the other things you can control better. When you're mentioning um, insulin resistance and blood sugar levels, it, it is something that we are hearing more and more about now. And I think probably, I mean, within the medical community, there's probably been a growing recognition of this, but it's now just sort of spreading to the public where we're like, all those years of being told to eat, um, diet yogurts that were low in fat, but they had sugar piled in and so on. We've got that the wrong way around, have we not? I mean, how important do you think um, managing those blood sugar levels are? And is it sugar now that has replaced fat as being sort of public enemy number one when it comes to our, our health and how it relates to our diet? I would say everybody needs to look at what's right for them. So for example, I'm not somebody who eats a lot of sugar, but what I have realised is if I go to a certain point of carbohydrate intake, I really do miss that. And because mm -hmm. I'm eating whole grains, I feel that it's more satisfying. So I think it's about finding what works for you. There are people out there who do low carbohydrate diets and really find that that's how they're able to control at what they eat and they're comfortable with it. And other people who hate it, it's not a binary choice about whether it's fat or sugar. It's about making sure that your overall diet quality is good. Because if you're overall diet quality isn't balanced enough you're not getting all of those important micronutrients because some micronutrients are more um, easily absorbable by the body because they're in fat so if you're not eating good fats then you're not going to have the micronutrients that come with it for example vitamin e that's that's where you're going to find it and also it's about having variety as well so the more you restrict your diet the less variety you have so you may have heard the mantra about you need to have 30 different types of fruits and vegetables or plant foods in your diet and that is where the diversity comes from it's about making mm. sure there's a little bit of everything it's not necessarily a whole plateful it's just a little bit of lots of different things are helping to give you a wide and varied diet so that from a gut point of view you've got good gut health you've got good gut microbiome but you've also got a balance of nutrients across the diet so if you decide yeah. to really cut back on your carbohydrate and that means you're going to have to put something else in its place so that you're not hungry. And that could be a protein or it could be fats, but you don't want too much of either of those two either. And that's yeah. why when we talk about balance, we're talking about making sure the amount of carbohydrates, so your starchy fruits and um, vegetables, your potatoes, your pastas, your rice, all that type of thing is balanced against what you might have from your beans and legumes and poultry and meats mm. and, and dairy foods and the fats again so if you're using things like rapeseed oil olive oil a small amount of butter as opposed to you know mm. a large amount so things that are high in fats but making sure there's enough of each so that you're not still hungry and then snacking yeah. and then you don't end up with negative food behaviors that mean that you become more unhealthy i feel for myself that just trying to shoot down the middle at the moment um, and finding that balance is is the right thing to do because there are a lot of books and, I, and I've been reading them. Some of those are really making an impact in, in this field and they are really focusing on sugar and carbs and lowering those carbs and some of them um, take an even more extreme view and say, you know, you should be operating on a very low carbohydrate diet and taking your energy from fats. Is that a healthy diet in your view? Or because there's been some research recently about, um, I think they, they followed a number of people who had higher cholesterol from being on a diet of, of, of that kind. What, what's your view on it? My view is finding the right diet for you. I think there will be people who do okay on a very low mm -hmm. carbohydrate diet, but it's not for everybody. And like I was saying before, these things aren't binary. It's not an either or. There might be times where 
you're able to get through a day and it's fine in times where you do feel like you need more carbohydrates. But it's about making sure that you set yourself up for success. So you're not trying to kind of cram certain foods and then try and make up the balance later on in the day. For example, if you take protein, for in order to, to get the, the best out of protein, it's about like spreading it out throughout the day in, in large enough chunks, so you're not nibbling at things. So for example, you get 20 or 30 grams of protein in one hit, and then it's not just one meal, you might have it across two or three meals. So things like that are really important to take care of. And if you are going to reduce your carbohydrate down, it's about looking and seeing what you're going to replace it with. So if it's going to be fat, again, as you mentioned, Mm -hmm. saturated fat is not how you want to top it up. You want to make sure that you're looking at plant-based fats. You're looking at things that are cooked in rapeseed oil, for example, or olive oil. Try and make up that balance. And if you're doing a diet that's got lots of rules and restrictions, that is going to have an impact on your relationship with food. And the way that we eat is not purely around getting fuel in. So as nutritionists, we learn about food chemistry and we learn about how to put things together. But life isn't like that. So you will go to birthday parties, you'll have, you know, cake afternoon at work or pizza parties after the office on a Friday night. There's all sorts of social and cultural elements that are surrounding food. And you've got to be able, we're social animals, we've got to be able to socialise. And what I'm seeing with a lot of these books is they forget that people have families they have occasions where you need to be able to get on with everybody else and celebrate and enjoy Mm -hmm. life and it's not like where you say alcohol yes or no we all have to have food regardless of whatever else we're doing it's it's essential for us to live but it's Mm -hmm. part of our society it's part of our culture and what I've seen in my research is when you have people who are getting older and living on their own the first thing to go is that social structure. When that social structure goes, the ability to enjoy food and eat well also goes. So people who've been widowed or people who have um, moved away from family and friends because of their work who suddenly find themselves on their own, their appetite goes and the quality of the food they eat goes right down. Mm -hmm. So then they're just in a, a situation where malnutrition has arrived at their door. It's not something they've really chosen, but they've ended up in that situation. And people who go on controlling diets where they're just ticking off lists of things and just trying to get some control back in their life, they really are missing out on some of those richer forms of of sharing and existing with other people in a way that's socially acceptable because they're so fixated and so driven on, I must eat like X, forgetting that you have to fit into a wider social structure and be part of that cultural activity that's around you. Otherwise, you'll end up eating out of a little plastic pot or a cardboard box, as I guess it is is now more that it's a socially acceptable thing to do when everyone else is trying to, you know, join in a conference or a party or what have you. You need to be able to integrate. And by that, it's by doing things in moderation, which doesn't sell books. That moderation message is the public health message where we're talking about looking at your overall diet from day to day and making sure you get the different colours and different flavours and different nutrients. But again, that is not getting people into a tribe that's exciting. Yeah, because it's not a regime that you can stick a name on. Yeah, but we're the moderation regime. We're starting it, Barbara. Happiness and enjoyment and socialising. I mean, these are things that are drivers of, of, of long, good good quality lives as well. And um, I think that people can get very wrapped up if they start the start a diet. I mean, I've started that just now, you know, just on trying to sort of scale back sugar because I'm a sugar fiend love it um so trying to make those changes in my diet and and then i'm all oh if i have a piece of cake do i have to drink apple cider vinegar before i have that piece of cake because i've heard that oh dear it gets very complex when you go down that route doesn't it it does Um, and people end up in that space and you think the the time and energy you spend in that place you could dedicate that to something more useful in terms of personal development mm -hmm. or looking at how you can do exercise that's going to benefit you and give you that lower blood pressure that, you know, you've caused a lot of the stress of trying to lose weight. (laughs) (laughs) I also wanted to ask you about another big trend. I do a little bit of this naturally myself, actually, which is intermittent fasting, because after I eat my dinner at night, I don't then tend to eat until about half 10 the next day when my stomach wakes up. I mean, is that a good idea? Because we hear that giving your body a period of rest to repair and do all its other functions is good. Do you think it's helpful? 
It's interesting because uh, I follow a dietitian who's been specialising with patients with breast cancer. Mm. And that was something she always used to tell. And she still does that about intermittent fasting because people found it helpful. But what I would say from looking at ageing is that people's appetites naturally reduce over time. So as you age, you'll have noticed with grandparents or your own parents that they're eating a little bit less after a certain period of time. And the, the studies that people have done, the academic studies show that in rats, fasting and restrictive eating is actually helpful as they age. And I think the jury's still a little bit out there as to whether that's helpful for humans. But I think there are so many other factors that decide on how we gain weight or how we age. It's very difficult to tease out from one individual to another because one of the biggest things is really socio-demographics. So for example, how wealthy you are, where you live, and the state at which you start your, your aging journey, that's gonna be the most impactful. Mm -hmm. Anything else that you layer on top. So intermittent fasting will be helpful from a calorie restriction point of view, but whether or not across everybody that's helpful, I think it's it still remains to be seen. But for some people, mm -hmm. it's a comfortable place to be. It helps them manage, balance their food out much better. And like I say, it's about finding what works for you. Mm -hmm. I've used it in the past really successfully. And for example, there's other things that I've tried when under medical supervision, reducing carbohydrates was an absolute fail for me. So it's about finding what works for you and what you're comfortable with and that fits in with your life. And naturally, as I'm aging, I know that my appetite is going to go down. I look at older relatives and see that like, you can't put a full plate full of food in front of them just doesn't work and I think from an, a digestion point of view and what's comfortable in your stomach I find it helpful to have a large period of time between my last meal of the day and my first meal of the next day. The other thing I wanted to ask you about was dairy because oh I mean the number of times I've heard that dairy causes inflammation and so I've, I've tried to reduce dairy and then I've swapped onto something like oat milk and then I've heard on some podcasts that oat milk actually causes sugar spikes because it's just broken down in the body and, and then I'm back on dairy so I'm back on dairy <laughs> um does it cause inflammation <laughs> It's one, unfortunately, I think the nutrition community just has to hold its hat up and say, or hand up rather, and say that the goalposts have kept moving because research mm -hmm. is a continuum, isn't it? So when you look at the last 50 years, research has chopped and changed as more information becomes available. And the latest information is that dairy is protective for heart health in small quantities. So it's about looking at this through a lens and saying, okay, I've got new information. What am I going to do with it? And I'm going to put out the moderation message again. I know it's really boring and people don't like it, but a little bit of something is better than going all in and just saying, right, I'm going to focus on this particular food group and cut out that. Once you get into this business of cutting things out, you go down the obsessional route. And the obsessional route means that from a, a mental health point of view mm. and being able to just engage with food in a really positive way and have a good relationship with food, you start to lose it. And food is one of those those relationships that is incredibly important in life because we we have to engage with it so many times during the day. So if you then start putting restrictions and boundaries artificially that don't need to be there, it can it's not going to end well over the longer term. And so it's about looking at, at what's important within your life and saying, how is how important is it that I stop doing X with my food? What damage is it going to do? Because when you think about the things that are impacting our health overall, air quality is huge. And you think about some of the activities that people are doing to do with their drinking habits or their vaping or smoking habits. All of these things are impacting. Food is only one of those areas. So we do need to take a step back sometimes and be less obsessive about the one thing that we can control in inverted commas because we're making a decision about it at least three times a day and think about some of the other things that we can't control. And these are the things I need to be looking at, my blood pressure, my blood sugar levels, things that are measurable, vitamin D levels. When you look at the population, there are so many people who aren't taking a vitamin D supplement. And that is the number one way that we can easily improve our health and yeah. improve our immune health. And so many people aren't doing it, but they'd rather focus on one particular product or one particular food type and think, well, how can I manipulate that? Yeah, absolutely. No, I started taking um, a vitamin D supplement a, a few years back and um, I, I see an enormous difference, particularly in the winter. Um, and even how I feel, even how I feel through the winter, um, 
I feel much more energized because of it. Um, I wanted to ask you just finally, because of what you've learned, your own journey, you know, from working in the food industry and then thinking, oh, hang on a minute, you know, how are we contributing to uh, the, the, the greater good of society and the health of society here? And then, um, you know, studying nutrition. Have you seen an impact with dietary changes in your own life? I would say so. What I'm realising is nutrition knowledge and, you know, from my studies as well, I know that nutrition knowledge isn't the be all and end all. We're human. We're influenced by the people around us. We're influenced by advertising, social media. And obviously your genetics and your environment shapes how you are. And it's not necessarily your choices. We think that we choose our food. We really don't. And when I was doing my research back in 2017, when I, I was awarded a scholarship by the Nuffield Farming Trust. And I was looking at dietary recommendations in different countries and the level of vegetables and diversity of vegetables people were eating. And I realized that my diet was changing in each country. I'm still the same person, you know, with the same preferences, but in each country I was eating as people do in that country. And in the States, I was constantly full of indigestion and issues. In China and Japan, I just felt amazing. My skin looked good, but I was eating a lot more vegetables and I was still eating street food or fast food, but the, the food that I was able to get hold of, the quality of it was so much better from a diet mm. point of view. But I was a lot healthier in those countries. So even though me and my knowledge hadn't changed, my environment had changed around me. And that has a huge impact on what you eat and how you behave. I, I love the moderation message, Barbara. I think it's a really important one. And um, thank you so much for your time and, and coming on to the channel. I hope we'll see you back here again one day when you can spare more time for us. Oh, that would be absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. So I hope you found that interview helpful. What I like about Barbara's message is that it's a simple one. If we can stop worrying so much about following a particular regime, and focus more on eating high quality natural foods that are dense in nutritional value, then we can't go too far wrong as long as we're keeping our sugar intake down and trying not to eat too much. That's largely where I'm at. I have upped my intake of what I think of as good quality fat sources like Greek yogurt, olive, coconut oil, some butter and cheese. I've upped my protein intake and lowered my carb intake and I'm cutting back on sugary foods and trying to pretty much cut out processed foods where I can. What I'm also aiming for is to reduce blood sugar spiking to avoid developing insulin resistance. And I do that by following as much as I can this guide by glucose goddess Jesse Inchausp, which is life changing and easy to follow. And I know I mention it at every opportunity. So forgive me this third mention in recent weeks, but it really is a worthwhile read. If you enjoyed this video, I'd be very grateful if you could give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already done so for more Aging Well content like this. And do let me know what you thought of this interview and the diet that works best for you in the comments. For now, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.